Welcome to Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. This is the show where we actually dig into a deep subject. The great thing today is we are digging at Vallow's Pumpkin Patch and it is digging deeper with our audience with questions from the audience. So you will come to the microphone, you will tell us where you're from, and then you will ask your question. And you are first on the docket. Uh, my name's Tom Jamison from Omaha. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the question is that, you know, when you have the bugs like on, on just like uh, cucumbers and, and tomatoes and stuff like that, uh, yeah, there are the chemicals that you can use, but if you want to kind of go organic, is there any way to use something else like eucalyptus, vanilla, vinegar, dishwashing soap or something like that? Well, picking them off is probably the best way to go if you're going to do something organic. And it depends what it is and what crop. So if you're going for squash, squash bugs, I've actually been using a cordless, like a battery operated vacuum for the squash bugs. It's been working really good. I'm out there vacuuming the garden. It's not the weirdest thing I've done, but that's, that's worked. Um, hand crushing the eggs. If you're looking for tomatoes, if it's the hornworms, you know, picking those off and giving them some kids for school project, those are fun too. But, you know, anything you spray that's like a, like an essential oil or vinegar, that's still something out there that may damage your plant, especially if it's like full sun or anything like that. So, I mean, if you're active and you're willing to get your hands dirty, go and, and pick them off. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, next up, critter question. Good afternoon, Hi. I'm from Ralston, Nebraska. And my question is around the eradication of animals. We often hear questions with how to remove them from the landscape. What I'm interested in is, what is in general the governance for introducing wildlife to the landscape? In general, maybe I want some snakes out in the landscape. You cannot translocate any native animal more than 100 yards. So you have to enhance the ones that are there. And you cannot translocate any animals into the state that are not livestock and contained. So the law is we don't want exotics or foreign animals in our state. Um, and so and that just causes biodiversity problems and we get invasives and then our native animals, uh, <coughs> excuse me, diminish. Yeah, not a second question, but it would be the thought of introducing native animals to your landscape, not you exotics. You have to bring them in. You can't move them from one place to the next. Okay. Thank you. There's no translocation because for the most part, um, even biologists like myself, wildlife biologists, we're not sure what the genotype is in middle of Nebraska versus the genotype in the eastern part of Nebraska, and we don't want to mix genotype. That makes sense, thank okay? you. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right, excellent. Next question up. Hi, I uh, live in Missouri Valley, Iowa, and Early in the spring, and then now again, I have a problem with chipmunks. We live in a very wooded area, and they're digging in my flower pots, and I don't know what they're after. Because it's new dirt, it's not like they're acorns from last year, or anything, because we have oak and walnut trees around. So why are they digging in my pots? Okay, it's pr it wouldn't be chipmunks, probably, even in Council Bluffs. They hardly get there, maybe 13 line ground squirrels, or might be Franklin ground squirrels, um, which are small ground squirrels. Um, but they could be after the roots of the plants or the moisture in the roots of the plants. And so it may not be acorns they're after, but they're maybe just the bottom or roots of those plants that are giving them moisture or something else. The way to do it is before those plants start growing in the pot, put chicken wire. The plants grow up through the chicken wire Okay. Yet they can't dig in the chicken wire. And they can't dig. So there's nothing I can do about it now? No. Except, well, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and that's usually the answer we get. <laughs> All right. Do we have a rotten spot question? No. Oh, we're out of order. Rots and spots. No, no rot. <laughs> She's got a rot, and that looks like a spot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Omaha and I have a garden with the usual green beans, but they have developed brown and the, I've taken off half of the plants, left half of them, but I'm wondering what is the cause and 
what can I do regarding next year if it will affect the soils? Let's see. Oh, that's her. Kyle, you have to talk. Yeah. Well, I, I wanted to look at the <laughs> look at the beans because it's because so often it's. There's just a random spot on my green beans. And what is it? Well, it's green bean leaf spot or something along those lines. Um, but you know, as far as what's going on here, this, you said it was about half of the plants as well? Yeah, well, I've taken out half of them. And the others that are still around, and they're a little more shaded from taller plants, they're starting to show the same thing. The shaded ones are showing it? Yeah. Or the? Yeah. Okay, because at first I was wondering if it was maybe just a little bit of sunburn well, that you were seeing. Yeah, in the middle. On this. That's what I took out, um, perhaps. But as far as, because this does not really look pathological to me, okay. um, or at least not a, there's not a, not a fungus that's causing them to be, to be this color. It could be, could be some sort of root issue, something like that. Um, but really, as far as just general garden disease management, you know, next year, if you can rotate, if you can move them into a different area, and then try not to grow beans in that same area for about three years, okay. is if possible, it's not always, not always the case. I know I put some trellises up and I'm not gonna move my trellises every year, okay. but if, if, if possible, try to, right. try to rotate. Thank you very much. All right, now we have a hort or a landscape question. Kelly, take off your sunglasses. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So horticulture, uh, what is it works? Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Beverly from La Vista, and this has been in my yard a few years and I've cut it down, but I thought it would bloom and it hasn't. So I'm just curious if it's something I want or what it is. Can I see it closer? Is it oh, I know what it is. The trumpet vine? Oh yeah, it okay. is. Look, I was gonna say, <laughs> but it, looks it hasn't like, bloomed. Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> and how many years has it been there? Oh, five easy. Well, it's still trumpet vine. I, yeah, am I hot? Yeah, it's still trumpet vine, and you might not want it to bloom. <laughs> How do I get rid of it? Uh, it's difficult. Do you, if you want to get rid of it, I mean, if, is it growing in the lawn? Is it yes. growing in? Okay, so I mean, you can use you can use some of the broadleaf herbicides if you want to try to get rid of it. But it's, I mean, it's a nasty weed. It's 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 a, it's a beautiful vine if it's growing up a telephone pole and you keep it in bounds. Because um, it's trumpet vine, and those are the ones that get the bright orange. I mean, awesome for hummingbirds and that type of thing. But it's a vine that you know we sometimes say, "Watch out! You get out of the way, it'll take over." So if you do want to try to control it, um, I mean, it's either constant clipping or it's or you can treat it with um, one of the broadleaf herbicides. Good to know. Thank and you. And keep, but you're gonna have to keep at it for a while. Yeah. So, okay. audience, that was trumpet vine. No, you don't want it. No, nope. <laughs> pure and simple. Even if it has beautiful flowers that hummingbirds like. All right, do we have a, an insect question, a bug question? Okay, bug one, up you go. <laughs> Hello, I'm Hi. Ruth from Omaha. Um, question, digging up onions and potatoes and discovered white grubs. So the plan is to move the plot for those two items next year, but are there other preventatives that could be well, done? Are they feeding, like are they like maggot grubs or are they like white grubs? White grubs. Like, like Japanese beetle grubs? Oh, I'm not certain. Like are that. they C-shaped? Yeah. yeah, they're C-shaped. Well, well, to me they look like a typical grub that's kind of fat and wormy looking, but creepy all at the same time. Is it destroying the, because they aren't usually no. eating the potatoes. No, you just don't it, like them there. Right, it just doesn't <laughs> seem like a good thing to have. <laughs> Um, well, there's not really a treatment like that you can do for the soil if you're going to plant things that are edible. So unless you want to treat and then leave it for, you know, a few years, then I would probably just pick them out now because those are the ones that are going to emerge next year and feed on the flowers and things like that. Okay. So the grubs are in your garden. <laughs> <laughs> but if you mix them in with a salad, it puts a lot of protein in there. Yeah, you know, I, you pick them out Mass chafers and you feed them to yeah. the birds. Like I put them in a tin and yeah. I just put them Barbecue on Barbecue them or something. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Swiss Family Robinson, like a pat of butter. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Do we have a critter question? Critter? No, no, critter. Critter. But isn't that a critter? Critter. From Omaha. No critter. All right, we're going to skip critter and go to, what is it? That's a dentist's question. Oh, it is a dentist's question. 
Oh, that's look, what I want to know. Cow. Some molars. <laughs> oh. It's a prehistoric uh, beast. Pre it was found. My wife found in our yard, and it's been the house was built in the mid 70s. Yeah, but this is much older than the mid 70s by the look of so the book. How did it get there? Even a dog could have brought it there, or it could have been very low in the ground, and then with freeze and thaw, freeze and thaw, freeze and thaw, it comes up. But this is definitely bone. This is that looks like maxillary. So here. Not me. Uh, um, <laughs> um, my teeth aren't that big. Well, wait, wait a minute. This side. It would have been this side. Okay. Um, and it looks like an ungulate or something that is very much a herbivore by these grinding type of things. So, and it could be an, you know, an 1800s horse, or I can't age the bone, but it's at least back 100 years. But it could be back a thousand years and be some kind of um, animal that was masticated a lot of trees and uh, plant material a thousand years ago. Um, but I can... <laughs> so you have it? the choice of yeah. continue digging and see what else comes up, yeah. or just cover it back up again. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. yeah, so I, it came from down below. Um, are you in an area that could have been where a river used to be at one time? Or? Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. Ice Age. Yeah. It's a dinosaur. <laughs> it could be it could be prehistoric or it could be just old, old. But that bone is weathered enough that's at least a hundred years old. So you know, it's either a hundred year old horse or a thousand year old small horse creature. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Rots and spots. Hort, go. Skipping you, Kyle. Uh, oh, I'm used to it. Have a little nap. Hi, my name's Heidi, and I'm from Morris Bluff. And we've got an ATV walking trail around the sand pit lake, maybe a mile plus long, getting a lot of poison ivy on it. What can we do? Because the trail's real close to the, to the lake. Same, I mean, same thing. It's just constant, I mean, herbicide treatment. I mean, it's broadleaf herbicide, and just was it growing in? It's growing in grass along there. It's growing in, in grass. It's okay. the, the path is a wooded area. Uh huh. So I mean, it's going to be tough to do. And just know, you know, know that with poison ivy, it's urushiol is the oil that's in there, and it's in the stems, it's right. in the leaves. So like, if you get the idea that in the winter we're going to go out there and pull right. it out, the sap is still in there, and you can still get it all over you. You never burn it because right. you can breathe in that oil and the right. smoke. Um, otherwise, it's, if you want to control it, it's just going to be, um, I mean, you can clip it, but you've got to be extremely careful and we're... I, we're, we're talking a mile-long path, yeah. so... Uh, it's, yeah. You're probably looking at a broadleaf herbicide registered for use in turf, in lawns. That and, close to the lake, though? Um, it, check the label, it, check the label and, if, and follow whatever the label says under environmental. On the okay. label, it, there'll be environmental and it'll tell you... Um, you know, how far you have to be away from the lake or any other in, uh, precautions that you need to take. Okay. Um, and some are probably better than others. Um, you know, I just, I hate to see you see, using a non-selective like glyphosate or Roundup because you want to keep that grass there. Right. And growing. Um, so I would just, you have to read the label under environmental. Okay, thank you. Okay. And there is a brush killer registered for poison ivy. Yeah. So. Mm, there is, mm -hmm. and there are some, and there are some aquatics. There are some things that are registered for close to water. But. All right, we're back around it. Bug two. <laughs> I'm Jack from Seward. Uh, my question deals with galls. Uh, I understand what galls are. Yep. All right. So, so on my burrow for the last ten years, I've had these black galls. I think by black wasp probably. Then about five years ago. I started having the apple galls on my swamp oak. Now my question tonight is, this year there are no galls on those trees. So the question is, environmentally is something going on where we're gonna see less galls? Did something occur this winter where the galls are just not there this year? I wish I knew what those <laughs> patterns were because sometimes it's like gall after gall after gall. But every organism has like their waves through their population. So whether it's, and we didn't have like a f 
trees or anything like that, but may, sometimes it's like predators, prey, you know, Anything those relationships. The dryness that we're occurring, maybe not. I have no Fire idea. Okay. But you should enjoy it. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> I enjoyed the gulls. You said they <laughs> cause no problem. Yeah, they're All just right. there. They're just there. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you. All right, do we have another critter question? Carla. So this is an old sorority sister of mine. <laughs> it is. How are you? That How ages us. That? <laughs> <laughs> that ages us. Yeah. Um, I have a critter question about voles. Okay. So who takes that question? Okay. So we're uh, several of us here today are with the Butterfly Garden at Veterans Park in Papillion, and we have had one of the wings of our Butterfly Garden uh, that has uh, had all kinds of voles, and we've tried multiple ways of eradicating them, including juicy fruit gum. <laughs> that doesn't work. Okay, but um, anyway, what would you recommend? That has been an ongoing problem all season. Okay. So voles are what we call microteen rodents. They'll go from 25 per acre up to 250 per acre and then just crash on their own. So you can wait a little bit and they'll crash. Or you can use what's called a box or a trap. These will hold up to 15 and you put them out overnight with just a little bird seed or grass seed and you have to check them every morning. morning but you, they will go in there and follow each other. So you need to get four or five of these traps. There's several brands, you can get them on the web. One's called Catch All, one's called Tin Cat, one's called Victor's Box Trap, a lot of different brands. None are better than the other. And um, that's the, probably the best way. You probably don't want to use any poison seed because then you're going to hurt um, the uh, birds that will eat the carcasses of the dead voles and you know hawks and things like that so we want to avoid that so capture works very well and all you do is need to nestle these boxes near their trails okay and then you have to drown them no, oh you don't have to <laughs> okay I might be calling you about that <laughs> all right thank you very much you're welcome okay a disease question <laughs> Hi, I'm Marilyn from Lincoln, and my question is in regards to the powdery mildew on peony bushes. Mm -hmm. This year, we have several different peony bushes. Some have it, some have it really bad, so I've been watching the show. Those that had it really bad, I've cut them down to the ground, cleaned it up. Now what's going to happen next spring when they come up? You will have powdery mildew. <laughs> so un unfortunately, it's... You know, pretty much every year it, it, will, it will come back. You've, you've done all the right things by cleaning everything up. You've removed a lot of the inoculum. However, um, there will be some of that fungus that, that, will, that will still be there. Um, and so if, if you can thin them early next year and try to, um, try to thin the peonies, just to anything you can do to increase airflow through the canopy will decrease the amount of powdery mildew that you see. Those, um, those certain couple varieties that you would have that aren't, where you're not seeing any powdery mildew, those could easily be, have some resistance as well. And so you could try to encourage more of the resistant um, peonies to grow. But unfortunately, it will come back next year as long as there's um, not adequate airflow through the canopy. Okay, so when you're saying thinning, that's different than dividing them. It's like you can kind of go in there and clip the branches yep, yep. and Just, yeah, do, more some, airflow. Some pruning to, yeah, pruning to increase airflow through the canopy. Okay, yep. thank you. After they flower. Yes. 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 Horticulture. Yes. Excellent. Hi. So, hi, thank you for being here. Um, have a question about, we planted a peach tree and it didn't even make it through the first year and it, it died. And so we, but we had been watching, and so we, we let it have another year, right? And it didn't do anything. But, but it did, but suckers shot up, and like one shot up like several feet. So we we're wondering, like if we trimmed all the other suckers back and then trimmed the, the, the dead tree down, I mean, the thing's like four or five feet tall now. Will it be productive at all, or is that just a waste of time? Vaughn, where are you? No, probably not. <laughs> Because it is suckers or, you know, the tree, once it dies, it's the roots way of trying to save the tree. It needs foliage for photosynthesis, so it'll shoot up those suckers, but they're usually weakly attached. I mean, I know some people will keep them and they'll try to grow them as, 
you know, a shrub or and see what happens just for the fun of it. Mm -hmm. But it's usually a cultivar and it's probably came from below the graph, so you're not going to have the cultivar you bought. Right. And I, I think you're much better off just purchasing a Start new tree. Over. And mm -hmm. yeah, peach trees are tough <laughs> to <Apparently>. grow in <laughs> Nebraska, but good luck. <laughs> Thank you, you can you can grow them just there's certain cultivars. <laughs> Two insect questions. All right. I'm Carol from Randolph, Iowa, and I have a question about my uh, squash bl bl blossoms. I have ants on them. Is that good or bad? They're just there. They're probably either collecting like extra floral necklaces or they're eating aphids. So they're not bad. I love ants, so okay. I would say they're probably <laughs> just doing ant things, being predators maybe. They're, it shouldn't be a bad thing. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Hi, Jack. Yeah. Uh, I got a question. I was, um, I, you see, yesterday I worked at Farmer Dave's. Um, he owns um, a produce thing over by Lanaha. He owns a farm. And I was working in his greenhouse, and he told me that he, he has a problem with, with grasshoppers. He wants to know a way to, like, remove them organically. He's got, like, a greenhouse full of tomatoes and peppers, and they're, they're everywhere in there. Yeah, so right now it's not a good time to get rid of grasshoppers because they're, they're really big right now. Oh, yeah. So next year when they're little, he can probably do some mowing of the weeds that are close by that greenhouse, and that will be organic because there won't be any chemicals there. Mm, okay? Good. Excellent. All right, we're skipping back down. Skipping the men. Skipping the men. All right, Kelly, you're in the hot seat. I'm up. Hi, I'm Pat from Omaha. I have a question. I have um, a garden in the front where these mulberries are growing up, and because I don't have the strength to pull them out, I just keep cutting them down. But is there a way to kill them with some type of a poison, herbicide type of thing, mm -hmm. that will not kill everything around it? Is it, a, are they, you said a garden, they're growing in a garden, so like a vegetable garden, a garden or a I flower? don't have space between my plants. Is it a flower I, I like garden that. or a vegetable, is it a flower it, garden? It's flowers, it's And yes. ornamental grasses. Like again, so probably, I mean, glyphosate and doing the glove of death. Um, you can, the other option is you can clip them, you can mix glyphosate or Roundup with some 2,4-D and you can, as you clip them, you can treat that stump, kind of a cut stump treatment, but you have to do it within five minutes okay. of cutting it. Uh -huh. You can't cut it and then, you know, the next day or a few hours later come back. You need to be ready to treat it right there. The problem is when they're small, you know, they're, it, it's a small stump. Right. Um, but that is another option if you don't want to do the glove of death. I mean, those are pretty much your two options. Okay, thank so. you. And obviously with the glyphosate, don't get it on anything else in the garden that you don't want to kill. I thought I'd put boxes around and just kind of stand there and yeah, hold yeah. them. I realize not to get I've, it on I've me. Done that. But I've taken like cardboard and put it by a weed and then spread between the plant, my good plant and the plant I was trying to kill and sprayed it and just that worked. I so mean, I tried it in Ohio with yeah. uh, a glove, I had plastic yeah. and then a, a cloth glove uh -huh. and I had thistle everywhere. I could not get rid of it. We were kind of out uh -huh. in the country. Oh my gosh. <laughs> And That's get, another toughie. Yeah, it, once you let trees grow, the best thing with trees is in that spring when they're germinating and they're growing and all summer long. Just keep an eye out for them. And, you know, I work with master gardeners in a garden and I'm the one that goes around and pulls all the little tree seedlings because I know what's going to happen if we let them go too long. So, oh, yeah. just, Well, there were, there were a lot of things that went too long when we moved into the house. So. Yeah, that happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank, you. thank you. Are we... Jody? Jody. Hi, this is Melody from Waterloo, and I just learned about Asian jumping worms this oh. past week. Are they in Nebraska? And yeah. if they are, will they overwinter? They they have an annual life cycle, so even if they do make it through the winter, I mean, if you've got like if you take your pots inside and they're in the soil, they may live a little while up there, but usually they don't live as adults over winter, but they'll leave these little cocoons in the soil, and that's how we've found that they've been transferred around. So the cocoons will overwinter. Yeah, but if you have them, they would be very large now. They may be like this long. They thrash around. They are unmistakably not the, the earthworms we're used to, the, not the night crawlers. They live very close to the surface. They will, if your mulch has been decreasing rapidly, um, it could be, but you will see them if you're digging and they, they will thrash out of the ground. So basically the only way to control them is to hand pick them out? We, yeah, we'll say hand pick, but right now we're not sure what overall will happen in the environment when they're here. So we're just telling people to monitor them. They're so widespread right now. Oh. You know, find out what's growing good in your garden and what's not growing well. 
and uh, you know maybe we'll just learn to live with them. Okay, thank you. Next question. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here, and I wanted to know if anybody can identify this. It, uh, it's growing in my flower garden, and it's about five and a half, six foot tall. What did you say? And that is off the main stem. Elderberry. Oh, okay, yes. Oh, I, it's just the leaf. Oh, yeah, it's just one leaf. Now that I get a close look at it, yeah. um, you brought me part of the compound leaf, and elderberry, as Kim said, it is. So, get rid of it? Um, Will it come back next year? Is yeah, it a, it'll come back. It's, it's a big an, elderberry. Uh, is a great big, huge, huge shrub. It'll get 12 feet by 12 feet. It'll get great big. It's not an annual. It's it's yeah. If okay. you probably if you don't want it growing there, then I would get rid of it. Okay. Thank right you very there. much. It, it's going to be out. Uh -huh. well, I had elderberry on my acreage. I made elderberry wine. Yeah, they. Oh yeah. I don't have the room for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's Thank not you. a bad. You don't have room for wine? That's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not a bad plant, but it's a huge plant. So yeah. if it's growing where you don't want it. <laughs> Cute. Hello, my name is Ruth. I'm from Omaha. And last year I had a really bad problem with orange aphids all over my milkweed. Mm -hmm. This year I have it on my butterfly bush, and it actually killed the butterfly bush. And I tried. You guys, I know you say to squirt, and, but you got to pull it off, too. you got to wash it with your hand. And I just... Is there anything you can spray on is it, them? Is it butterfly weed, like the milkweed, right? That's yeah, no, it's a butterfly bush I got. Because oleander aphids, there it may be a different type of aid. Oleander all aphids orange. are always on milkweed. Uh -huh. So yeah. if you've got like honey vine milkweed wrapped around, sometimes you'll have them on there. Um, it's like a strong spray of water, but it's like repeated. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. I did it every day and use my hand, try to get them off of there. They're, now they're mostly gone. But yeah, I, just... I started pruning some of the ones at the top when they first started coming. Mm -hmm. So the thing with aphids is that they do not need to mate to reproduce. So when you spray them down, if there's still some left, they'll reproduce really quickly. So I would say like, you know, every four to five days, go out and spray it with a hose. They're mostly gone now, but again, thank you guys so much. <laughs> just my dream to see you all. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. I think we have one more. And then we're finished for digging. Thank you. Um, I'm from Seward County, and this is a forsythia question. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, I have a struggling forsythia that I'm not ready to give up on, but there's a volunteer tree now that is growing right up through the shrub. And so anyway, if I would cut that volunteer tree down to the ground and tord on it, or you do get, something get, awful get, to it. You'll probably lose your forsythia, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, so yeah. so any any options? Just the, same, you may, the main options that I've already covered, I mean, you just continually keep treating it. You try the glove of death with glyphosate, or you treat it with like a, like a glyphosate or Roundup and 2,4-D mixture. So when you clip it, treat it okay. immediately. And if it's a smaller trunk, I mean, you're going to have to, you probably are, just watch it. And as soon as it... I think the problem is sometimes we cut those back and then we wait till they're really big again and right. they have a chance to photosynthesize and produce more stored food and then that just, you take one step forward and two steps back or whatever. Right, the tree so, is growing much better than the mm -hmm. forsythia. Yeah. <laughs> so you just, you just, you need to be diligent and you just, you have to wait till those roots run out of stored food and you can't let any foliage grow on that for any length of time or like I said, one step forward, two steps back. All right, thank you. So, sure. And that is actually all the time we have tonight for Digging Deeper. We want to thank all of you for giving us those questions, letting us dig deep. You can watch us, of course, we get posted. And, of course, you want to watch Backyard Farmer. <laughs>